Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eunsu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. And I'm Doug Lane. I'm your senior pastor. We want to welcome you to this worship service this morning. And also, we want to welcome everyone who are joining in our worship service through Facebook live streaming. We are grateful to worship together this morning. We believe God is here right now, ready to touch our heart and listen to our prayers as we lift our voices in praise. Today, we have several exciting announcements in our church life. And I'd like to kick those off by inviting you to fill out a Connect card, especially if you're new. Um, they're in the pew racks in front of you. Or if you're not getting our e-blast, maybe you've recently moved. We're just trying to keep up with you. So if you wouldn't mind uh, filling out one of those Connect cards and putting it in the offering plate. also want to let you know that we have large print bulletins now in case that's something that you might need. And if you're watching from home, uh, we'd love for you to uh, simply type into Facebook to let us know that you're watching. Thanks so much. Thank you. And next Sunday, October 15th, we will be presenting Bibles to our fourth graders. So if you have a fourth grader in your home, please mark your calendars. And today is the last day to sign up. So if you want to register or if you have any questions, please email Christina Norval. Also, Pastor and Sue's about to start a new Bible study that begins this Tuesday. It's a discipleship class in the United Methodist way. It's not, a, it's not disciple Bible study. It's not that 34-week uh, class. This is a six-week class on how to be a, a disciple in the, in the United Methodist fashion. What does it mean to be a, a Methodist? And you can sign up for this class by um, going to the Deep Roots Bulletin Board out in the hall and just signing your name. I know that there's room, and I know you're going to want to get to know and sue better, too. Thank you so much. And this Thursday, October 12th, we have a special gathering event for adults in 30s, 40s, 50s at Venue in Wilmington. Um, please be sure that to book your theaters and just please stop by at any time. And there will be a food truck for those um, the wishing get dinners at the time. That sounds fun. Yes. Um, also, next Sunday is uh, one of the highlights of the year. It's our annual Blessing of the Animals, and it'll take place at 4 o'clock out here in the parking lot underneath the Fellowship Hall. So uh, bring your... your puppies, your kitties, your snakes and lizards, whatever you got, and um, we'll, we're going to bless your animals uh, next Sunday at 4. Thank you, and this is the last one. I believe everyone remember last Sunday's sermons from Pastor David. So there are people from Mission of Hope, Rotafunk, Upstairs, and Fellowship Hall. So if you are interested in sharing your love, and if you have any questions, please stop by in Fellowship Hall and take some time with them. These are all announcements we want to share for right now. So you can find more details in the event in the insert. Now prepare our heart before God. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord.
Thank you so much. Please join me in our opening congregational prayer in our blue team. God, make us fertile soil in this time of worship. Till our hearts so that we will grow your fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In our daily lives, keep us from striving, and instead, help us trust the work you are doing in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, our opening hymn is Be Still My Soul, number 534 in our hymnal book. Please stand as you are able in body or spirit. each other with a sign of peace, saying, peace be with you.
I'd like to invite them now, including uh, Richard and Peggy Harkey, if you'll come on down. There they are. And Blair Harkey and Tank Nickerson. Tank? There he is. All right. If you want to come on up here where everybody can get a good look at you. There you go. Turn toward the congregation. And if everyone will get out the bulletin insert so you can follow along with our ritual. We have just a couple of questions to ask you guys in order to make your membership official. And so um, the answer is I will. All right. Okay. As members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, your answer is I will. As members of this congregation here at Wrightsville United Methodist, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Church, we give thanks for all that God has already given you. And we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Let's welcome our newest members here at Wrightsville. <laughs> Peggy, Blair, Richard, and Tank. Um, and I, when they return to their seats, I hope that um, you'll take a moment to see where they're sitting so that after the service, you can come up and welcome them and uh, introduce yourself. Uh, let them feel um, welcome and at home here at church. Uh, help them to get to know you a little bit better. They've all attended our newest uh, membership class, which took place a few weeks ago. They've been worshiping here for a while, and we're just grateful to have y'all. And not only for you to be a part of us, but to see the ways that God is going to be working through you. So uh, thanks for uh, being a part, and congratulations. I'll let y'all return to your seat. And i uh, let you know that uh, this class uh, that's joining brings the number of new members for the year up to 99 new members this year. Um, yeah, that's a really cool thing. Um, it's, that's, the most, that's the most new members we've had in a year in over a decade. And, um, and since we're um, at 99, I just want to uh, give a shout out. If there's one more out there that wants to join, come see me. And let's continue to worship the Lord our God. Now, our finest comedy chair, J.C. Lyle, will share the stewardship testimony for us. Good morning, church. My name is J.C. Lyle. I started attending here in the year 2000. Since then, this congregation has nurtured me and challenged me and given me countless opportunities for service and leadership. In fact, in 2006, I joined a church service day with a nonprofit organization that was founded by local United Methodists. We repaired the home of a widow who didn't live too far from here, and we learned about the organization. It's called Wilmington Area Rebuilding Ministry, WARM. I fell in love with the mission, and three years later, they hired me as their first full-time uh, executive director, and I still work there today. Uh, and it's the honor of my life, truly, to witness all that God is doing um, and have a front row seat to what he's doing through WARM. But when I was hired, I had no educational or professional background in nonprofit management, I had very little leadership experience except church committees and uh, mission trips. So I technically wasn't really qualified to run a nonprofit. Um, but I realized through this job that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the people that answer his call. And this church has been such a powerful force in equipping me uh, for that call. And it's an example 
of the United Methodist mission statement to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I'm one of those millions of disciples that God has made through the church. And so are you. I love working in the nonprofit sector. Uh, it's full of mission-minded people and improves the world in countless ways. And we work really, really, really hard to raise money. To connect our donors to causes, we frequently use this technique that is industry term called transactional giving. You've probably been a part of it before. It's buying an event ticket to a luncheon or a golf tournament, um, buying an auction item where the proceeds benefit the charity. It's also for $1,500, you can buy um, a ramp for an elderly widow. For $50, uh, you can feed a child for a month. So transactional giving. One donor pays for one thing. It offers a variety of ways to get involved, provides tangible results for a donation, and satisfies this um, desire that we have to make a difference in someone's life. But transactional giving, when we think about our giving on, that, on those granular terms, it really can distract us from the whole point of philanthropy in the first place, which is to change the world together. Transactional giving only promises, here's what your $600 can do all by itself. Transactional giving is finite. That approach would do disservice to the mission of our church. Can you imagine trying to put a price tag on make one disciple? We couldn't do that because we do our part and God does his part. Spiritual giving. Unlike transactional giving, spiritual giving is limitless, right? Your $500 is combined with millions and millions of other Christians' dollars from all over the world and multiplied by the God of creation to advance Jesus Christ's mission. A mission that began over 2,000 years ago has touched billions of people and will endure throughout eternity. Now, I raise money for a living, and that's literally the most exciting opportunity for giving I've ever heard. For those of you who faithfully give to Wrightsville, thank you for being part of this incredible journey. Prayerful giving brings you closer to God. Supporting the mission of the church together brings us closer to one another. I give because I'm grateful for all that God does in this world, and I want to be a little part of it. Over the next few months, you'll hear more stories about why people in our church family give. And I encourage you to join us in exploring why you give and consider deepening that commitment this year. I'm going to leave you with the words of Henry Nouwen about giving. God's kingdom is the place of abundance where every generous act overflows its original bounds and becomes part of the unbounded grace of God at work in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, JC. Amanda Mountfort uh, will read Psalm 15 for our worship service in October. Good morning. Today's reading is Psalm 15, and I will be reading from the NIV Bible. Hear the word of the Lord. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to lead us in prayer together today. Will you join me now as we go before God in prayer? Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together today. We thank you, God, that you are patient with us. When we read the story of scripture, we see that you never give up on us. No matter how many times we fail, you are always there, willing to stick with us. God, we ask today for patience that reflects your patience. Make us more like you. As you understand us, help us to understand the people around us so that we can be patient even when they frustrate us. God, sometimes we are impatient over little things. But you know, God, that we also wait for big things. We're waiting for you to set the world right. We are waiting for your justice to roll down like waters. We are waiting for death and sickness to be no more. We are waiting for you to wipe away every tear from our eyes. We are waiting, Lord Jesus, for when you return in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet. It is hard to be patient when we are waiting for these things. We thank you, God, that we are not alone in our waiting. Romans 8, chapter 8, tells us that the very earth is groaning, longing for you to set all things right. As we await your ultimate victory, we know you have called us to help bring your kingdom to earth. And one of the ways you've given us to do that is prayer. So God, we pray for these things that we are particularly concerned about today. We pray especially for peace in Israel. And God, we now name before you all those particular concerns we have, either out loud or in our hearts. Lord, thank you that you hear our prayers. We love you and we trust you. Now help us to mean what we say as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our ushers will come forward now to uh, receive God's tithes and offerings. And as that happens, I want to remind you that um, you can give not just by placing a gift in the offering plate, but also by using that QR code that is in the white insert on your bulletin. Um, that gives you a way to give online if that's easier for you. Let us now continue to worship God.
for our children's sermon if any of the kids want to come forward and join me up front. Hi, everyone. It's so good to see you guys today. How you doing? Good. Good. Thank you guys for your wonderful music. We really appreciate you leading us in worship. So I'm Pastor Julia, um, and today I want to talk to you about something called patience. Does anyone know what the word patience means? Yeah. It means you have to wait. Yeah, patience means that you have to wait. Yeah. And when we have patience, it's it's we get to wait in a way that's a little bit calmer. But it's really hard, right? I have trouble waiting for things. Um, what are some of the things that you have a hard time waiting for? Um, wait. Yeah, when you're waiting in line for something, yeah, that's really hard. Christmas? Waiting for Christmas. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's so long. Waiting to get to uh, park ride at Disney World. Oh, yes, waiting to get on a ride at Disney World. That is like the worst kind of waiting. Yeah, yeah. Waiting for your birthday. Waiting for your birthday. Oh, my gosh. My birthday was in July, and it's like, come on, what? It's going to be a long time before that comes back around again. That's really hard. Well, waiting can be really, really hard, right? And even when somebody says, be patient, it's hard to be patient, right? Well, um, I had a lot of trouble when I was your guys' age um, waiting for something, which is waiting for pancakes. Does anyone here like pancakes? Yeah, cool. So not as many as I would have thought, but that's okay. Well, my mom used to make pancakes for us on Saturday mornings. And um, it took so long. It took so long to make the batter and to get the stove hot enough and then to wait for all of the pancakes to be cooked so that we could all sit down and eat them. And so one time, I thought, what if I just ate the batter? And I knew I wasn't supposed to do that, but I just really couldn't wait. And so I tried a little bit. And you know what? It was disgusting. It was so gross. It didn't taste like pancakes at all. And I realized that it was better to wait for the pancakes to be cooked than it was to eat the batter right then. Well. There's a lot of things that it's really worth waiting for, but it's still hard to wait. But I have good news, which is that God helps us to be patient. When you are feeling frustrated and like you can't possibly wait any longer, you can ask for God's help. You can say, God, please give me patience. And God will help you. And God will help you to become more patient. So let's say a prayer now together. Will you guys repeat after me as we pray? Dear God, God, thank you for making me. Thank you for making me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Help me me to be patient. To be patient. I love you too. I love you too. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you guys can go back to your seats. Thank you. Well, hello again. Uh, Thank you, Pastor Julia, for teaching us about patience. And uh, we are now to the time where uh, we're continuing to learn about the fruit of the Spirit and... uh, We have a memory verse that we've been sharing throughout this series. If you'll turn with me in your bulletin, and we'll see there that patience is the fourth fruit. Let's say together Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And to teach us a little more about patience, we're going to turn over to Hebrews chapter 12, reading the first two verses. 
The writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance, other uh, translations say patience, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, I pray that we might hear what you would have us to know. And Lord, um, where I become a stumbling block, I pray that we will simply, uh, that you will intercede and that you will help us to hear the most important things that come from you and not from me. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we mentioned today's sermons on patience... Patience is the ability to wait for results that do not happen immediately. It's rather ironic that this particular fruit of the Spirit fell to me. I don't see myself as a rather patient person. Uh, perhaps Pastor In Sue should have preached this week. She seems like a very patient person. Um, Pastor David told us last week that even though he's not a doctor, he has a lot of patience. <laughs> Me, not so much. I kind of look at patience this way. It's something you admire in the driver behind you, but not the one ahead of you. <laughs> True for all of us sometimes. Margaret Thatcher, the former Prime Minister of England, earned the nickname the Iron Lady. She seemed to suffer from the same human view of patience that a lot of us have. She once said, I'm extraordinarily patient, provided I get my own way in the end. Sounds like a lot of us. In the book of Hebrews, there's a fascinating phrase. The writer says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's an interesting antithesis here. Run with patience. It feels like an oxymoron, like freezer burn, or virtual reality, or jumbo shrimp. Run with patience? That's exactly how do you do that. Well, when I was a kid, I played sports that required short bursts of speed. People may complain that baseball is slow, but let me tell you, when the ball is hit, the players move extraordinarily fast. If I hit the ball, I ran just as fast as I could to first base. If I was playing the outfield, I would sprint to the ball in order to get it back into the infield just as fast as possible so that the runner didn't take an extra base. But as an adult, I started to slow down and work on my endurance. I got into long distance running between my mid-30s and mid-40s. This actually requires completely different muscle fibers in your legs than what sprinters use. But more than that, it requires a different mental mindset. In the two marathons that I've run, both of them took me more than five hours to complete. That is the very definition of running with patience. <laughs> I don't like watching TV for five hours straight. Can you imagine continually running for five hours? But that's exactly what the author is getting at. Life is like a long-distance marathon, calling for good conditioning, proper strategy, and great endurance. Mental, physical, and spiritual preparation is just as important as running the race itself. The goal must be firmly fixed, the desire must excite and stimulate, and the plan and purpose must have meaning. Running with patience means keeping a long-range strategy in order to prevent burning out on the course. The classic story of the tortoise and the hare illustrates this point. The tortoise won the race because he ran it with patience. The hare did not take the race seriously, was not conditioned for it, was careless and casual about its importance, and had no deep desire to do well. To his chagrin, he lost a race he should have easily won. The tortoise, all plodding and persistent, determined and enduring, moved unswervingly toward the goal 
and won his laurels because he was prepared to achieve. He had the patience and the will to win. But we're not a very patient people nowadays. We're always in a hurry, it seems. Just to give a few examples, people getting upset because their flight is delayed. Now, I know there are going to be people who are going to push back on this one. Um, I understand. i got to get to places. I book my flights around my needs and around my appointments too. But it seems a little strange to me that we get all bent out of shape because we now have to wait an extra 45 minutes to get on a flight that will take us all the way across the country in just a few hours while our great-great-grandparents grew up in a time when that trip would have taken six months in a covered wagon. <laughs> or how about this? This happened to me yesterday. Where you're in the drive through line and you go to get your food and they tell you to pull up because the food isn't ready yet. What? This is fast food. I expect it to be ready now. If I wanted it to be good, I would have gone somewhere else. I just want it to be fast. But the absolute worst has got to be that stupid spinning wheel on my phone that lets me know it's searching for a website that I want to look at. Sometimes I've got to wait up to 10 to 15 whole seconds for that website to appear. I get so impatient waiting for things, especially on my phone. So I'm typing in, who is Travis Kelsey? <laughs> waiting, waiting. I think I have a bad signal. Waiting. Oh, there it goes. OK. He's the tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs, an eight-time pro bowler, two-time Super Bowl champ. He's been on reality shows, Saturday Night Live, many commercials, and hosts a podcast with his brother Jason. He's also expected to be either a hero or a villain on Taylor Swift's next album, but you'll have to wait and see. <laughs> I try to tell my kids, you know what my search engine was growing up? It was called a card catalog, and it could only be found at the public library using the Dewey Decimal System. And my kids look at me like I grew up in a cave and had a pet dinosaur. Well, during Jesus' three years of public ministry that proved vital to the world's salvation, we find no indication of impatient haste or bursts of speed that outdistance his contemporaries. He would pause often for prayer, for rest, and contemplation with his Father. He calmly taught his disciples and waited for the message to be absorbed into their often dull minds. Although the crowds grew larger and would push in and around him, the Gospels indicated that he showed infinite patience with individuals and their needs. There was so much to do and so little time to do it in. Yet no fruitless haste, no irresponsible rush. He allowed himself to be interrupted without getting off track. Running with patience, he stayed in step with God giving his very best self in a very short time. The rest remained with the Lord of the harvest. Now contrast that with St. Paul, the activist who would get upset with undue delays, upset plans and circumstances that were beyond his control. Rebellion, he finally found, was fruitless. Rampant frustration only led to useless anger. So from behind prison bars, he sat down to write brilliant letters to people and churches preserving the very best-known records of his thoughts and teachings. But what if he'd never stopped and written them down? What if he'd never been imprisoned in the first place, forcing him to pause and write? The delays and impediments that stopped him in his tracks actually became the most productive ground for him to spread the good news. No wonder he could say at the end of his days, the glorious fight that God gave me I have fought. The course that was set I have finished, and I have kept the faith. Looking back on his life, he said that, but looking ahead, there were times he would have struggled to believe it. 
Nevertheless, when all the days were in and counted, the ledger showed that he had run his life with patience, learning from his handicaps, overcoming his frustrations, circumventing his suffering with patient perseverance, learning in his loneliest moments what God had to teach him, and always moving uphill with his face toward God. Of course, when it comes to trials and tribulations, we still speak of the patience of Job, right? Through his period of testing, his cattle were stolen, his children were killed, his wife deserted him, and he became the victim of a terrible illness. Suddenly, he's cast from the heights of affluence and success to the depths of misery and despair. He kept his balance because he didn't question the Almighty, but held to the conviction that heaven had a purpose in all of these experiences for him. He kept running his race with patience, even when it appeared that he had little left to live for. His so-called friends questioned his righteousness. His wife told him to simply curse God and die. But when the fog lifted, Job was still on target. And we read, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Job died at the age of 140, being old and full of days. I want people to say that about me, that I was full of days. Being told to be patient when you are in pain or suffering is a hard pill to swallow. How easy it is to blame God and rebel in bitterness. But then the unhappiness merely compounds itself. Only as the complainer learns anew the forgotten lessons of patience do grace, understanding, and perspective finally appear. Wholeness comes with healing, and healing comes with acceptance. Acceptance makes for understanding. Understanding presents alternatives. Alternatives make for sound choices. And sound choices result from being prepared. Preparedness comes from patience. Patience means waiting for the joy of discovery. Patience is the homework of life. It is preparation for every important experience. It's the creative waiting the sound assurance that this too shall pass, and on the other side of the mist, the sun will still shine and God's face will be there. Patience means staying in step with self-capacity without trying to outdistance God. It's the art of being receptive, the ability to sort out the useless from the meaningful. It's creating quietness to listen. Yet it's also the determination to maintain a steady course, the stabilizer when panic threatens. It's the resolution to stay alert for the best signs and the worst times, and the grace to accept those things that cannot be changed. It's an art to be practiced, really, a skill to be sharpened, a faith to be kept, a philosophy to maintain, a hope to keep bright. It's not blind surrender to inevitable fate or the cowardice, the cowardice to just cease to care. Instead, it's simply recognizing that in every life come those moments or days or weeks, maybe even years, when all the pieces of the puzzle just don't seem to be present, when the clear course of action appears fuzzy, when the patterns aren't ready to be recognized. And so we wait. And yet, with waiting comes discovery. Or out of nowhere, although obviously it's from somewhere, it seems to just steal across the mind, stimulate the senses, motivate the thought process, energize the intention, batter down the barriers of uncertainty. And suddenly the answer is just plain. The direction is clear. The knowledge is sure. The heart is ready. The soul is set. What appeared to be regression was actually preparation. What seemed like despair was really patience working out its slow wisdom. What looked like time wasted turned out to be the most fruitful of all. 
And looking back on what appeared to be just the passing of time, turns out to be making the best time. That's running with patience. Let me say one more thing. I have an unshakable faith in the ultimate providence of God. And still, more often than I want to admit, I've tried to hurry it along or manipulate it to my own ends. There are times that I have resented or rebelled against what I believed were the results or implications. And yet, as the years go by, my faith in the leading of God has only grown deeper. God moves with mysterious intent. I don't always get it. Our ways are not his ways. Our wants are not his will. Yet to the one who truly listens, God supplies answers in abundance. To the one who's willing to wait, God gives invaluable insights. To the one who does not curse the darkness, God uses the blackness as a backdrop for brilliant illuminations. To the one who waits patiently, Trusting in a providence that comes outside of oneself, God provides grace upon grace to meet, overcome, or accept your needs. God is ever more present than we realize and so much more active in our lives than we can possibly imagine. Old doors may close, but new doors have a strange way of swinging silently open. Now, some call it faith. Others call it just plain luck. Many call it hard work or their own self-making. I call it the leading of the Lord, the direction of the Spirit, the guidance of Almighty God. Now, I realize today is just a random day in October, but it doesn't have to be. This could be a brand new day. An all-important day. A day in which you made the decision to accept the days still to come as a gift. So may we run with patience the race that is set before us. Our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Here today, may God give us wisdom for our task and patience for running the course ahead. In the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving Lord, we struggle with patience. We live in a world where we can get pretty much anything we want at our fingertips. Lord, help us to live by your timeline and not try to manipulate everything to our own. Show us the ways of salvation the means of grace, and how patience can lead to deeper understanding. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 430. I invite you to stand as we sing, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee.
Cooper's up here on the front row. She's a member of our staff parish relations committee, and uh, and she wants me to remind you all that uh, this that today kicks off our um, staff appreciation week. It's a uh, pastor's appreciation week in the church, and I want to thank Hope and the staff parish committee for lifting us up. Um, and, but what I got to tell you is, a lot of y'all read your email before coming to church. <laughs> Because so many of you have come up and said, I like Mexican food too, just like you, Pastor Doug, or, um, or I like your favorite rock group, just like you, Pastor Doug. So it's, it's, been, uh, it's been great connecting uh, with folks that way. Um, again, thanks to the, to the committee for lifting us up, uh, and we sure do appreciate all of the ways that uh, you as a church um, are in ministry in this world, and that's really the, the greatest gift uh, that we have, is to look around us and see the ways that we are, we are interacting. Um, but sometimes, right, the results don't come just as fast as we want, and we learn that in ministry. Um, you know, it's, I, 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 I'm going to take, a, I've got three minutes. Um, <laughs> so, I used to love mowing the yard, because when I got done mowing the yard, I was done. You know, I'm finished with a task. I still like doing laundry because I can fold the clothes and put them away and I'm done with that task. And there are things in life that just don't come that way. And a lot of it happens in the church where it takes sometimes weeks, months, even years for the fruit to grow. And you see that. You see that in your own lives when you invest in education. If you're playing the stock market, if you're trying to grow your children, right? We have to be patient. God has a way. And that, and that way, I don't fully understand, but I trust. Go forth and trust in God, having patience for each new day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.